Tracy Harding and I'm coming at you from Oz Comic Con in Brisbane where I'm going to be interviewing Isabel Carmody. That way. <laughs> Isabel Carmody is one of Australia's most loved and most prolific fantasy authors. She's written in excess of 25 novels, just as many short stories, and six picture books. These are including The Obi Newton Chronicles, The Legend Song Saga, The Legend of Little Fur series, and The Kingdom of the Lost series. She's won the Australian Book Council's Award for The Red Wind, numerous Oralis Awards. She was, in 2016, voted Australia's most popular author and is currently completing a PhD at the University of Queensland. Hey, I'm Tracy Harding and we're down at Oz Comic Con and I'm here with Isabel Carmody, my dear mate. And um, we're just going to do a bit of an interview. And first thing I want to ask you is what made you want to become a writer? Well, I was writing at 14. I was, you know, unhappy and miserable and a misfit. And writing was where I went with it. I took it all into my, my Harry Potter's room of requirement, which was my writing. Yeah. So, yeah. Are, are you... A, me? Yeah. Um, what made me want to be... Because uh, I, I used to tell stories all the time when I was younger so it's like it kind of progressed from being a storyteller to being a story writer really and I always sort of said that I never really said that I'm a, a writer I was really a storyteller and I still am really yeah so do you research a lot no no so it's quite fantasyful most of this stuff um well um what I'm writing about is really how people evolve intellectually and ethically and morally. Yeah. And most of that is kind of an inside process. Like you set up an, a thought experiment of what if I put a character here and give them these abilities and, and this situation, what will they do? So yeah. then you logically follow through your character. So the need to research isn't there. That said, I am writing a novel which requires research into death rites, like how we bury people or what we do at the end of life. What are the rites and rituals that we use? So I'm, I've researched that. Research for me is very idiosyncratic. I don't have to know everything. Yeah. And But I need... I like the words sometimes from various areas or I like the way that they talk. I like information connected to specific events and that can be language and ways of seeing. So it's that kind of research. It's a bit, I can get drawn sideways into some obscure inquiry about stamps yep. because I'm following this <laughs> idiosyncratic path and often it leads me to something good. <laughs> And what about, like, what's the best time of day? Or you're just one of these people that can sit down and write on a dime, aren't you? I can, and I sit, when I sit down, it's always there. But I do, like everybody, I think, I procrastinate. I'm, I might wake up in the morning and think, this is a great day. I'm going to work all day today. I've got a whole day free. And then I'll think, maybe I should just, I'll sweep the floor first because I don't <laughs> like that dirt there. And then I'll, I'll wipe the, and actually, since it's so close to, to lunchtime, I might as well have lunch. Yeah. And I'll have lunch and then I'll work. So I'll have lunch. And after lunch, I'll think, well, I'll just wash those dishes and what are we going to have for tea yeah. I do need to go to the shops and at 10 o'clock at night I'll think oh my god now it's time and I'm tired and it's too late so many days go by and it's silly when you think about it because I love what I do I find it really interesting nevertheless I procrastinate yep. and what about your road to publication how did you come across how did you get to be published well back in the days when r dinosaurs roamed the earth and I began <laughs> with Ober Newton yeah. I we didn't. Were there in in Ugg boots. Yeah. Well, I didn't down. know the publishing animals. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't actually know how you went about being a publisher any more than any kid who starts. I wrote Over Newton first at fourteen. When I was taking it to be published or thinking of offering it to publishers at like twenty, yeah. I didn't know how to do it. But inside the front cover of every book, very conveniently, <laughs> is this little writing where you find out all the people that have ever published it. <laughs> See here in this tiny little writing which you can't read, yeah. it, the address of every publisher that ever published it. Right. I thought it was terribly convenient. So <laughs> I, I wrote a list of publishers thinking you have to get rejected. Yeah. And uh, then I sent it off to the first publisher on the list and that was Penguin. And they didn't reject it. So that was the beginning. Awesome. Yeah, I came out of the slush pile. <laughs> <laughs> no agent. And so have you ever self-published anything? Not yet, but I am thinking of doing it. I've done... I've published a couple of times through smaller publishers and I've liked the process. Yeah. I've sometimes, in order to find out what it was like, yeah. I, um, 
But I am thinking of bringing out um, a couple of books that I'd had published before and writing the final conclusive volume and publishing it myself. So uh, mostly because I'm curious about what the process is and I would like to document the process and be very transparent about whatever money comes in and then use it as the basis of articles and maybe to lecture on about what it is to sell. Because if you're a traditionally published author, you don't know all those figures and you don't want to know. And if you're a, a small or publisher author, most people tend to keep their numbers private. So I would like to commit to doing a kind of a very transparent process, have a, have a website, employ some, some of the talent that's gone sideways out of the traditional publishing world. Like I would ask a, um, a, a cover artist who used to be employed by Penguin to do it. I would ask the artist that I once had as the series uh, to do the third book, which is not a practice that publishers have because they'd be looking for somebody new now yeah. um, I'd use my separately so and I don't know how much that costs so yeah. it'll be a real uh, fact finding information gathering exercise I suppose that's where my research goes I'm yeah. curious so that when I'm at panels and at comic-con and I'm asked these questions I can respond out of real information that's so excellent. I will do it once I don't ever want to do it again because I think it'll be a lot of work yeah. Yeah. I think it will be a lot of work I agree are you um, really precious about your characters or are you sort of a plotter to kill them off sort of thing or? Um, well, I don't, I don't think about killing off a character. I sense that it, that it might be required sometimes. Like some books, you feel the arc of the story is going to require a sacrifice yeah. or something, something high level. And when it's that, uh, I mean, you know, when you know that's coming and you begin to sense it, I just, my heart sinks. And I just think, oh, and yeah. sometimes I've, in one book I wrote, I thought a character that is a much loved character, not only by me, yeah. was going to die. And I, I almost couldn't bear it. And it was interesting because another character in the book just simply wouldn't let it happen. Oh. And uh, I, that was a very beautiful moment to realise I, I couldn't do it, yeah. you know. That's awesome. And uh, with your, like, have you ever sort of built a world in one of your books that you thought, yep, I could live there? I suppose you do live there in a way. Yeah, in all do. of your books, you take the pieces of the real world you like and you build an imaginary world. But since they're always, you know, there are problems in them because you really, it's, a, it's like you're just taking something real and then you're you're looking at it from a different angle. So the world isn't perfect, so no fiction can be perfect or it's, it's full of lies. Yeah. Um, I would love to have telepathy, but I think that if you did, you would have to deal with people in different ways than we do now. There'd be a lot of migraines involved, I think. I think, and if you had empathy, imagine, like my daughter once said, wouldn't it be lovely if we could talk to animals like in your books, Mama? And I said, it would be horrific. Yeah. In the world that we live in, can you imagine the pain mm. and the anguish and the terror that we would have to listen to? Help me, please, over and over again. This is happening. This happened to my baby. This happened to me. How would you better? You'd, you'd go mad, you yeah. know, in the real world to have these powers. And I, I guess when I write, and I'm sure you do too, yeah. you, you, you realise that there are the dark sides of these things, given human nature, yeah. given the nature of power, given the nature of the world. Yeah. It's hard. To, to have a character, have everything turn out okay. It doesn't feel truthful. No, it's true. And so just just to wrap up, what do you think the meaning of life is? <laughs> just to wrap up, <laughs> meaning of life. To live intensely and with passion, it's not to be happy. That is can't be a purpose for life. No, I don't think to so. live intensely, I think art is essential aspect of humanity that we're you know, people like us, we're lucky because we have a conduit for it yeah. and we're evolved because of it. We're able to empathise because of it. Our imaginations are fed constantly, our desire for beauty, our hunger for it. Yeah. Um, so I think to produce something that's worthy in the world, yeah. that's important. And if you make art, then that's worthy. I think one of the sad things about the world is so many people don't engage in art either as people who go out and, and take it in or better still as art because I make it, I understand what it takes, I'm sensitised to it. People who think it's irrelevant or, or it's escapism or it's unnecessary, they're blind and half the problems of the world are, 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 exist because we don't have enough access to joy yeah. and, and one of the most obvious ac asset, you know, ways to get to joy is through, is through, through working at something you care about and that has to be the arts. Everyone should make art.
that's what I think the meaning of life is.